Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Gareth Newham. I am the head of the Governance, Crime and Justice Division at the Institute for Security, based here in Pretoria. Today on View on Africa, we will be discussing the question about whether President Jacob Zuma will find himself facing criminal prosecution by the National Prosecuting Authority following the recent High Court judgment that uh, found the decision to withdraw the corruption charges against him irrational. So this is obviously a very big uh, issue for South Africa because if these uh, charges are reinstated and uh, Jacob Zuma as the president is facing uh, prosecution, it'll be obviously the first time in South Africa's democratic history or history in totality that a sitting president faces criminal charges before a court of law. So just to give some background, uh, this case really emanates out of investigations that were started by the Scorpions as far back as 2001. Those investigations resulted in a team of prosecutors at the National Prosecuting Authority and then with Alani Guka, recommending that Jacob Zuma and his then financial advisor Shabir Sheikh face corruption charges. Uh, inexplicably or controversially, uh, Bulalan Guka agreed to proceed with the corruption charges against Shabir Sheikh, but in a media statement said that although there was a prima facie case to be made of corruption against Jacob Zuma, that he would not be facing prosecution. And the case against Sheikh then proceeded in October of 2004. It ended in a conviction for Sheikh in 2005. Uh, on corruption charges of involving 1.2 million rand in which he paid to, to Zuma to facilitate the relationship between them. Uh, it also included corruption uh, convictions for accepting a bribe from a French armaments company, Tails SCSF, and it entailed a fraud conviction for writing off debts or loan of 1 million rand that uh, Shabir Sheikh had paid to Jacob Zuma. As a consequence of that, Shabir Sheikh was uh, sentenced to 15 years imprisonment. That led off a chain of events to which the charges were then reinstated against Jacob Zuma on the 28th of December uh, 2008, shortly after Jacob Zuma had been elected as the president of the African National Congress at his Paul Akwane National Conference. The matter then went through the various courts and we saw the DA uh, 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 well, basically what happened then was uh, Mukhtar Yam who is the acting national director for public prosecution, uh, formally announced that he was withdrawing the charges on uh, the 1st of April 2008, which he duly did on the 6th of April. A month later, Jacob Zuma was uh, sworn into office as the president of South Africa. This case has then been dragging on since then, and eventually it got to the point where two weeks ago we had the Deputy Judge President of the High Court in Gauteng, uh, along with two of his colleagues, a full bench of the High Court, ruling that the decision that Mukhtar Sheh took to withdraw the criminal charges against Jacob Zuma was irrational. And that meant that these charges should be reinstated. And we're talking about 783 counts involving charges of corruption, fraud, money laundering, and racketeering of which some of those have already been proven against Shabir Sheikh in his trial. The president or the National Prosecuting Authority have until Friday this week, the 13th of May, to state whether they are going to appeal this to our court, namely the Supreme Court of Appeal. The judgment is a very scathing of Mukhtar Sheikh. It points out the timelines of the various meetings and decisions that were taken and shows that ultimately the any decision that's taken by the National Prosecuting Authority or State Energy has to be rational. There has to be a clear link between the decision taken uh, and the reason for that decision. So what Mokotelium Sheo said when he withdrew the charges in his public statement uh, on, the, on the 1st of April 2008 was that he was dis withdrawing the charges against Jacob Zuma not because of the merits of the case. In other words, the evidence upon which the decision was taken to charge Jacob Zuma with corruption was solid and they believed they had a strong case against Jacob Zuma nor was he taking the decision because uh, there was a perception or any uh, a procedure that had resulted in Jacob Zuma not getting a fair trial. In fact, a month after that uh, press briefing, Jacob Zuma was going to appear before court. He had a court date in which he was going to argue for a stay of prosecution. 
So in various letters and letters to Jacob Zuma's lawyers, Mokhtar Dibshay said that if you want to uh, take any issue with your your rights, with your this trial being unfair or any aspect of the of this case, you can do so before that court. And then, so it became a great surprise uh, when Mokhtar withdrew the charges. It then emerged throughout this case that uh, Billy Dana and four of his colleagues, along with two private advocates, uh, believed they had a strong case and disagreed with Mukhtar Yimshe's decision. They believed and advised him that the decision to withdraw these charges should be taken by a court of law, given the nature of the, the case before them. And indeed, the reason that Mukhtar Yimshe said he was withdrawing the charges was because he had heard transcripts of a conversation between then head of the Scorpions, who was leading the investigation against Jacob Zuma, Leonard McCarthy, and a former national director of public prosecutions, uh, Bulalani Nguka, in which they were discussing the timing of the charges, whether it would be better to charge Jacob Zuma before the ANC Polokwane conference or after. Mokateri Mshe argued that this so offended his sense of justice, he was so outraged by this, that that led to him believing that the only way forward was to withdraw the charges as this, this discussion and these tapes that were made publicly available had prejudiced the case. Uh, interestingly, it emerged in the, in, the, in the court case that the ruling, which we saw the ruling two weeks ago, uh, that Mukhtar Yimshe didn't really <clears throat> investigate the allegations against McCarthy. He uh, told McCarthy that he'd heard these allegations against him. And the, these, these allegations are incredibly serious because you have a person who's a member of the National Prosecuting Authority discussing a case uh, with a former person, with a person outside of the NPA, and is a a case of what could be very serious misconduct or even draw a, ten, a serious sanction by a court of law. And that is one of the findings of the High Court judgment. The, the judgment also points out, however, that Shed didn't really give uh, McCarthy and others a chance to respond to the allegations. He initially said he would, but did not allow them to listen to the tapes and did not receive their formal responses. And thereby, the court found that Mokhtar Shed had broken the Audi Partum uh, rule in which the other side must be given a chance to state their case before just proceeding with withdrawing the decision. It was found that there was no rational link between the misconduct of McCarthy, which is merely discussing the timing, and the decision to withdraw the charges because it would affect the case. In fact, uh, Mukhtadi had repeatedly said they had a strong case uh, and that any decision should be taken in a rule of law, uh, in a court of law. Of course, this could have happened uh, about six weeks after Mukateri withdrew the charges, and that was also raised in the judgment as why would um, Mukateri suddenly, so in such haste, in a case that had been dragging on for years, suddenly within a month uh, decide to withdraw these charges when in fact this could have been a deciding factor by a court of law. Also, it emerged that Mukateri did not really engage or listen to arguments from his prosecuting team who believed that the prosecution should go ahead as a matter of course. And so for all those various reasons, it was found that there was no rational link between the decision to withdraw these charges uh, and the misconduct of, of, of McCarthy. And that in fact, Shedder took no action or, or, or against McCarthy at all for this. Um, it therefore found that Mukhtar Sher had ignored his oath of office, which required him to act independent with fear of favor. Uh, and that there was no clear link between the allegations against McCarthy and the decision to withdraw the charges, and therefore the charges should stand. Now we have a situation in which a relatively newly appointed Sean Abrams, who's the current National Director of Public Prosecutions, has to make this decision about whether he would charge Jacob Zuma or not. Uh, technically in law, these charges should be where they, they should be standing because the, the situation as it was before Mukateri share withdrew the charges should stand in law. In other words, automatically these, case, these criminal charges sh should be uh, prosecuted. The only way that this should not happen is if either the National Prosecuting Authority appeal this judgment to the Supreme Court of Appeal, and many commentators have questioned on what grounds it would be. It's a, quite a damning judgment, and there doesn't seem to be very much room for arguing in the case of the National Prosecuting Authority that they uh, should certainly not prosecute this case, or they should co continue to think about withdrawing these charges. Certainly, given that the hard evidence shows that uh, you know the evidence has really been tested in a court of law against Sheik and has found to stand uh, the burden of proof of corruption. Um, 
the other option uh, is that President Zuma could appeal, and he uh, has been reported in the Business Day newspapers, those close to him saying he definitely will appeal. Of course, this is in line with uh, President Zuma's um, approach to most of these matters. It's called a Stalingrad strategy by some lawyers, in which every single technical point, legal point, argument is made to try and postpone and drag out these cases as long as possible. And, and indeed, this so-called spy tapes case has been going for over six years to great cost of the taxpayer. Recent budget vote for the presidential office shows um, that an amount of around 45 million rand has been used to defend president in various court cases. So it's immensely expensive. Uh, of course, it is highly likely that President Zuma will try and appeal this case uh, because he would not want to be in a situation where he is now, as the president of South Africa, facing criminal charges for corruption, for fraud, money laundering and racketeering. It would be a further blow and it would continue the ongoing uh, concern that many South Africans have about his presidency, integrity of the man, um, and issues such to do with state capture and other corruption allegations that are swirling around Jacob Zuma. So if the prosecution des uh, decides to go ahead, we'll put it this way, if Jacob Zuma as the president decides to appeal it, we do expect that the National Prosecuting Authority would oppose this application. Uh, they have the evidence before them. They should only be looking at the evidence before them and the law in order to decide whether to proceed or not. There should be no other factors influencing, which is why it's so important that we have independent men and women who had the National Director of Public Prosecutions. But of course, we've seen for some time now that there's been immense political interference and pressure on the National Prosecuting Authority. In fact, we do not have a, an, an NDPP, National Director of Public Prosecutor, who's finished his term of office. Uh, starting with Bully Lauren Luca, who resigned. We saw Vusi Piccoli, a man who was found by the Genuala Commission inquiry to be fit and proper for that post, being mm -hmm. fired. Uh, we saw a person found by the courts not to be fit and proper, Advocate Menzi Similani, being appointed. When he was eventually removed by a Supreme Court of Appeal judgment, uh, Jacob Zuma appointed Advocate Nonkobo Jiba. Uh, and she has been found wanting by around 12 different judges in three different matters. Uh, they, she's facing ac accusations and allegations of him being dishonest, of not adhering to the basic standards of prosecutorial independence and decision making. This was found by a judge, constitutional court judge, former constitutional court judge, Jack Kurb, who did an, a probe into the NPA uh, that the judges had rightly criticized her and that this conduct had severely brought the credibility and the public trust in the National Prosecuting Authority into severe question. And of course, we saw her being elevated to head the prosecution services under uh, uh, Sean Abrahams, which immediately caused a lot of concern, uh, given that it sent out a message that a person who has been found repeatedly by judges not to adhere to the standards required of a person in the National Prosecuting Authority uh, remains in decision of most of the most important prosecuting cases that have to be prosecuted. So that immediately then raises concerns about the extent to which these decisions will be taken uh, based purely on law and evidence, given uh, the history of Jiba in that role. And then we've also seen that if the prosecuting authority does uh, decide to uh, prosecute Jacob Zuma, either now or in the future, if the case is appealed, um, and it could go on for another number of years, we could see the Supreme Court of Appeal only hearing this case in another year or so, the outcome of that case could then again be appealed, either by the loser, resulting in going to the Constitutional Court. So it's quite likely that if this appeal process goes ahead, that Jacob Zubel will be long out of office before it is finally resolved and the prosecuting authority then proceeds. Of course, if Jacob Zuma does not appeal and the prosecuting authority decides to proceed with the case, the next matter of concern will be what will, who will be the prosecuting team. We have seen in the past, for example, where prosecuting teams have changed, in other words, um, will the initial prosecuting team under the very capable hands of advocate Billy Down and his team, will they be the ones who, to prosecute the case against Jacob Zuma? They're very familiar with the case. They received uh, very good convictions in previous cases and certainly against Shabir Sheikh. Will they be the ones to prosecute? We've seen that when the prosecuting team changes its uh, prosecutors, such as in the case, of, for example, against Glenn Akliotti, uh, that the case falls flat. Uh, we've seen that when poor or unprepared prosecutors are appointed to cases, such as the case of Andrew Stutani, who was killed by members of the public order policing units of the South African Police Service, that the case can fall flat. 
So the next question, if the MPA des decides to proceed with prosecution, is will they put the best possible men and women on that team to ensure a conviction, or will they change the team, thereby putting it at a disadvantage? So these are a range of different questions that uh, come to mind. Of course, this judgment uh, really does, again, raise concerns that the people who are appointed to some of the senior positions, particularly in the National Prosecuting Authority, do not act in accordance to their oath. And we really do need to be able to start trusting our National Prosecuting Authority to only make decisions based on law and fact. Same, similarly, we need to be able to trust that all those appointed to key positions in the criminal justice system, whether it's the police, whether it relates to the intelligence services, are men and women who are guided by the constitution principles that they swear an oath to uphold by integrity and by the facts before them. Unfortunately, too often, we've seen a number of years now that that is not the case. Well, that in a um, no small matter will depend on how President Jacob Zuma acts. If he says, I am innocent, I have nothing to fear from a prosecution, I'm willing to appear before the courts uh, and uphold my oath as the president of this, uh, of this fine country of ours, and encourages his supporters to let the process run and not encourage um, them to be violent. In fact, ensures that, that it's very clear from his point of view that he expects his followers to be disciplined. Um, then there won't be civil unrest. Uh, unfortunately, from what we've seen in his rape trial and other uh, concerns have been raised at the time, that that is highly unlikely. Exactly. But uh, we will have to wait and see if that in 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 uh, you know, that takes place. Um, but and of course, we have a recent judgment from the Constitutional Court that Jacob Zimmer does has not upheld his oath of office. Uh, so it is anyone's guess. Um, because obviously there are those who argue that it's highly unlikely that Jacob Zuma will be found innocent if he is properly prosecuted on these charges mm -hmm. <clears throat> because they have been, the evidence against him has been tested in various courts of law and is found to be hard evidence of corruption. So that the chances of him uh, being sentenced to a lengthy imprisonment term if he is prosecuted is very high mm -hmm. and therefore his calculation might be to use as many different methods and tactics as possible to try and avoid that mm -hmm. and that was certainly an issue raised with Mukateri Hibshay um, by various people including the then Minister of Justice Bridget Mbandla when he met with her on the 4th of December 2007 shortly before the Apollo Kwana conference that there were real concerns that if they prosecuted him or announced that he was being prosecuting, prosecuted, that there'd be a lot of civil violence. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, uh, Jacob Zuma did very little to prevent um, that and, and certain comments being made in his name and his supporters during the rape trial. So there was already a fear uh, that a man who puts his own political survival first, well, ad well ahead of the constitutional principles he sworn to uphold, um, you know, that's something that would be of concern. How widespread it would be, who would be directed against would be, a, would be an interesting matter. Um, vast majority of South Africans would not want to be violent to protect a man that is so flawed and is clearly and increasingly uh, based, as we see from various opinion polls, not respected, not trusted. So it would be a, probably a very small number of people, um, but probably large enough in particular areas like Kwasi Natal to cause enough of a, of, a, of a challenge. And of course, given his uh, control of intelligence services, the chance for misusing the police, misusing intelligence is pretty high. Mm -hmm. um, so these are all open questions. We just hope uh, that uh, for the interest of all of us and for the future of this country, uh, that the prosecutors are allowed to do their work and the courts are allowed to do their work and that people respect the process, processes there. People fought and died during apartheid, so we have a constitutional democracy. So to go against that would be literally to turn your back on those brave men and women who fought the liberation for, uh, fight to get us to where we are today. The importance of this judgment once again just shows how fortunate South Africa is to have an independent judiciary. Uh, that at least when it comes to the judges, uh, we ha do have men and women women who will only make decisions based on the facts before them and the rule and the, and, and the constitution and the law that makes, uh, that, we, that, that we have developed in our democratic dis uh, uh, disposition, dispensation. So 
we many ways are very fortunate in that regard. Uh, and I, as I mentioned before, you know, the basis of the rule of law is one of stability. It means that no matter who you are, if you are a poor person or a very wealthy person like the president, everybody has to adhere to the laws. Everybody has to make sure that you're not act, uh, in a way that harms other people or harms the country. And it does become important, therefore, that we have a prosecuting authority that is seen as lawyers for the people. It is very difficult for the prosecuting authority to have credibility if it is believed that there are senior people in the National Prosecuting Authority who are not acting at the highest level of integrity and standards expected of them to make decisions without fear and favor and only based on the evidence before them and the law. And unfortunately, there are examples uh, right now, as in the case of Advocate Chiba, um, allegations against another national director of public prosecutions, Advocate Mrebi, um, where there are judicial findings that that was not the case. Uh, and unfortunately, very little has been done to rectify that situation. We believe that most prosecutors, are uh, men and women of integrity, are working in difficult conditions, but do an admirable job. The courts are busy, uh, our prisons are full, there are many problems with the criminal justice system, but most people, whether they're in the police, the prosecuting authority, uh, the correctional services, uh, are doing a really relatively good job under diff difficult circumstances. Uh, the biggest problems we've really seen have been one of leadership, where there have been questions raised about the most powerful people in charge of these institutions, and whether they are willing to act in the interest of our constitutional democracy or are they are taking decisions for political reasons. Uh, and we have uh, seen time and time again various allegations being made, but I think judicial findings are the most important to look at because those are not simply opinions. Those are carefully considered findings after a range of evidence has been presented before a court of law in an open forum. That means that if you are uh, found by a judge to have uh, been less than honest, not to uphold your oath of office, as was uh, mentioned in the judgment against Mukhtarim Sheh, it is really devastating against the credibility, for example, of the National Prosecuting Authority. Members of the National Prosecuting Authority are there to uphold the law. They are schooled in the law. And in fact, we need them to be the best people they can be, because in many ways, that is the heart of the criminal justice system. We can see the police make as many arrests as they like, but unless people are being sentenced to prison or being properly sanctioned for committing crimes against the country and against people, uh, it really starts to break down a sense that we are all in this together. And those that are criminally inclined and have money and power, they will start using that to try and exercise influence over uh, politicians. Politicians, if they think they are not likely to be held accountable, or uh, some of them are likely to start abusing their powers. Police officials, for example, if they believe they're not going to be held accountable, or uh, some of them will start becoming corrupt. Prosecutors will become corrupt, and our system will start falling apart, and it will be to our detriment, to all of our detriment. So this case is of a seminal and critical importance in the history of South Africa. Um, how the NPA handles this going forward will really determine for many years to come, not only the public credibility of the National Prosecuting Authority, but the foundation of our constitutional democracy, which is one of the foundations, which is the rule of law. So we will be waiting with bated breath to see by what happens on Friday the 13th. Um, we probably do expect Jacob Zuma to appeal this judgment, but then we also expect the National Prosecuting Authority to make its decisions based primarily on the evidence before it and the law, the appropriate law. Uh, this is a prime opportunity to do undo all the damage that has been done by those in the past that have acted with less than integrity. Um, we will also be interested to see, for example, whether further action at any point will be taken against Advocate Lynn McCarthy. Uh, will there be an inquiry into that? Um, will actually be taken against him um, because when action isn't taken after a judge, judge says there should be, then we serious, do have a serious problem.